Hello folks and welcome back to World War 2 TV and a random show in the middle of what is normally Animals at War Week but this one came about because I was on a podcast with the incredible Paul Reed oh, about two weeks ago and my guest today was another guest on that and we kind of talked during the, the podcast and we talked afterwards and this idea came up so it is about a individual who served in World War II, which we have covered many times before, but it's also about the dealing with what it is like to serve in a war, the neuroses, the uh, PTS, or whatever you want people to call it, those can, um, syndromes that now have labels identifying people who have problems with that, and how that relates in this per particular family's history. So um, Dr. Victoria Humphreys is my guest today. I'll bring her in now. So good uh, evening, Victoria. How are you today? I'm very well, thanks, Paul. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So, um, as I said there on the top of the show, there we'll we'll talk a little. We'll get into the subject matter later on. But for the viewers who don't know who you are, um, what what's your kind of day job? And tell us a little about the book you're writing. So my day job is really just writing or researching. Um, I've got two books coming out next year, and I'm working on a sequel to one of those books. I'm, I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm just finishing my research for that sequel and I'm hoping to start writing it in October. And um, that'll be another Second World War book, but it will take us forward to the present day um, as well. So a bit more um, contemporary than the other two. But, yeah. Okay. And what, you know, the, the thing we got talking about on Paul Reed's podcast, and good evening, Paul, Paul is watching, is just about how everybody who goes through a war doesn't come out of it the same way. And and it came about when we were talking about veterans and people say, oh, the veterans would think this or what do veterans experience when they do that? And of course, the reality is every single veteran's experience is different to the other veterans' experience. And some breeze through it all without a care in the world, despite seeing death and destruction on a, on a, on a biblical scale. Others uh, don't uh, so your in your case it's your great uncle uh, Ron Stone isn't it so um, before we get into the presentation growing up and sort of being around at what point did the family realize that Ron's story was was I mean they're all unique but was something that was worth actually investigating I don't know that any I think the paper will show that there was never a sense of trying to investigate Ron's story for the sake of Ron's story. It's more about helping Ron come to terms with his own story. So there's never a sense of in fact none of the family knew what actually happened to Ron. They knew that he'd been captured, they knew that he'd been imprisoned, and they knew that he'd seen traumatizing things. But he when he came back from the war, um, he was very well protected by his wife. And uh, my grandmother, Louisa, who's mentioned in here, you know, it's very much that sense of don't trouble Ron, leave him alone, that kind of thing. So I, I don't I think that's what the paper will explore. Um, the fact that I don't think the family ever sought to investigate his story as such, but more to help him in later life come to terms with his story. Mm, and that seemed to be the immediate post-war way to deal with it was just to kind of let it be, just kind of ignore it hope it not hope it goes away but just uh, appreciate that these people have problems but don't really kind of poke the wasp's nest which is really i suppose the opposite from where we are today in that now there is a process in place to deal with people you know even coming out of uh, stressful jobs there's now a procedure you can go through to you know do you have any um anxieties upon this so that was typical for that generation to just kind of box it away somewhere both the both the sufferer and also the family around them just to kind of box it away leave it in that kind of cobwebby attic of the brain and hope that it doesn't manifest itself but um but i'm interested to you know where we'll go with this and so you're what you're, you're for the folks who are watching this is a kind of a presentation you've developed from a paper you wrote a few years ago yeah yeah so um i wrote this when i was doing my thesis so i was writing a doctoral novel as i will explain um and i was writing about war trauma um, and being anxious to write war trauma authentically, because I've not been in a war, um, I turned to somebody within the family, literally asking for one story. And I'll, I'll mention that in the paper. And this is how it came about. So I had no idea about Ron's story. As a child growing up, I was just always told, I mean, I was a very good child, um, but I was always very much told to just leave Ron be, don't pay any heed to anything that he might say. Um, and, and so I just remember him as being very quiet, uh, very tall, 
um, but very, very quiet and somebody that I kind of left alone, um, essentially, yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of people watching this will have a member in their family who they can kind of think, yeah, that was that was grandfather, that was my grandmother, that was my you know uncle. It's it as I said, it seemed to be that the experiences were different, but the way that the family has dealt with it seemed to be mostly the same. Just as I said, just kind of not ignore it, but just you know just accept it and move yeah. on. But anyway, as all my guests, you've come out armed with a PowerPoint, which we'll put up on screen now. You'll be telling me when to move on. Okay. Folks, what we think we'll do is we'll do kind of any big questions about PTS and neuroses and things at the end, the things that may take some time to explain. If there's a particular question about one of the slides Victoria is showing about a detail, we'll kind of address those as we go along. We, of course, we welcome your comments generally, which we'll put some up on screen. But the big questions, I think, we'll wait to, wait till the end. But basically, I'm going to hand it over to Victoria to take us through this story. And I'm hoping that it, and I'm, and I'm confident that it will kind of strike a, a chord with people and they'll recognize that their own families have, have, have these situations. And it's something that will kind of, we're, we're ad addressing the elephant in the room in some ways that is, 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 is definitely out there. So over to you, Victoria, and just tell me when to move on. Thanks, Paul. Uh, before I begin the paper, I'd just like to make two notes on the title. Um, so a, night on, a, a note on the expression bloody well cry May. Uh, during the Second World War, psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Tom Main treated depressed tank commanders with a therapy of his own design named compulsory mourning. According to psychiatrist Tom Harrison, compulsory mourning consisted of being confined alone in a darkened room for, for three days with one hour of daylight, one hour of electric light and a diet of bread and water together with the instructions to bloody well cry me. Um, and I, I will be mentioning war neurosis and post-traumatic stress disorder. I use both terms in this paper. I just think it's important to um, point out that the term post-traumatic stress disorder first appeared in 1980 in the third edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders published by the American Psychiatric Association. But obviously in earlier conflicts such as World War I and World War II, PTSD was termed war neurosis. So when I'm talking about war neurosis, I'm talking about what we understand as PTSD today. A slide two, please, Paul. So Ron Stain's account um, of his experiences as a combatant and prisoner of war during the Second World War begins. Joined the army at Acton, went into Middlesex Regiment at Hurst Park Racecourse on the 27th of January, 1941, just after my 17th birthday and concludes with, this is a, rough, a very rough idea of some of the things in my army days and hope that it will be of some interest. Our stone, 8th of February, 1995, now in my 71st year. Ron Stone is my late great uncle and the balance of his very rough idea amounts to 23 handwritten pages of A4 paper presented entirely in block capitals, the significance of which I will return to and produced at his daughter's insistence when he was a somewhat elderly man. I was unaware that Ron had written a memoir until I began work on my doctoral novel, The Other Way. The Other Way is a work of adult literary fiction that is informed by my research into the notion of intergenerational trauma and the psychosocial rather than epigenetic mechanisms of trauma transmission. The novel spans three generations of the Edwards family and begins with the traumatic events suffered by Alfie Edwards during his years as a combatant in the Second World War and more crucially as a prisoner of war in Germany. Knowing a little of Ron's background and being anxious to write war and war trauma authentically, I approached Ron's daughter Diane and asked her for any anecdotes that Ron may have told her in relation to his own experiences of combat and imprisonment. Diane subsequently presented me with his memoir. Diane thought that writing about his wartime experience might help stop the nightmares Ron had begun to suffer about this traumatic period of his life. However, this was not how she sold the idea of writing a memoir to him. Ron wrote his memoir because Diane convinced him that it would be wrong not to give his story to subsequent generations. This reason for writing is explicit in the penultimate line of his memoir. I hope that it will be of some interest. Diane remembers that the severity of Ron's nightmares and the distress that they caused him increased with age. Sometimes Ron would wake covered in bruises 
as a consequence of apparently fighting in his sleep. Kate McLaughlin's essay, War and Words, notes that one of the primary reasons for writing about war is that it is cathartic, the so-called writing cure. Diane also believed that the way to diminish the traumatic events plaguing her father's mind was for him to write them down. Social psychologist James W. Pennebaker argues that in general, writing about emotional topics is associated with significant reductions in stress. Most studies comparing writing versus talking find comparable biological mood and cognitive effects. Though Ron was never officially diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, the National Health Service defines PTSD as an anxiety disorder caused by very stressful, frightening or distressing events and lists witnessing violent deaths and military combat as the type of events that can cause PTSD. Slide three, please, Paul. According to Ron's memoir, he did see active service in North Africa and Italy, and as I will now show, witnessed the violent death of a good friend while detained as a prisoner of war in Stalag 4B. Stalag 4B was located in Muehlberg, 30 miles from Dresden, and Ron was imprisoned there from early 1944 till the camp's liberation in April 1945. Ron and his friend, a friend he never names, were on the same shift in Stalag 4B. They were forced to mine copper. They worked 10 hour shifts, seven days a week, with one Sunday off per month. They were fed one bowl of thin soup and three slices of bread per day and given 30 minutes respite during a shift. They marched two miles to the mine and two miles back and worked three quarters of a mile beneath the earth's surface in a space that was four foot wide by three foot high. During an early shift in the mine, Ron's friend became ill with a temperature and was duly sent back to camp because he was unable to work. However, a Nazi corporal, whom Ron nicknames Popeye, refused to believe that Ron's friend was ill and responded by assaulting him and ordering him back to work. Slide four, please. Ron then states, my mate went berserk and was hitting Popeye all over the place. Some German workers had to pull him away from Popeye and get some more guards from the camp who took my mate back to put him in front of the Feldwebel for punishment. Ron then writes that his friend went missing. The following day, after Ron had completed a shift, two of his shift mates were taken to the camp's perimeter fence and shown the body of Ron's missing friend. He had been shot twice, once in the head, just behind the left ear, and once in the chest. In order to justify murdering Ron's friend, Ron and the remainder of his shift mates believed that Popeye had placed their friend's body outside the wire to make it appear as if he were trying to escape. Slide five, please. We were all certain that Popeye had done the shooting. The chaps that they took outside to inspect the body had to carry him back in. They laid him on a table, still warm, so he'd only just been shot. Collectively, Ron and his shift mates demanded that a South African doctor stationed at a small prison hospital in Eisenburn, some three miles away, be summoned to examine the body and confirm their suspicions. Slide six, please. I just want to jump in for a second, Victoria, because yeah. I just to make the note that some of the people watching this, this is just about POW camps generally, is that the image we often have is from the, the officers' camps, you know, the Colditz and the Stag of Three, where the escape is on the mind. I think it's just a quick reminder to say that for the enlisted men, a lot of the camps, the, the food was crappier, the uh, the conditions were worse, and they were forced to work. I think it's just worth reinforcing that idea that sometimes we're left with a false image of what prisoner of war camp life was about because of the kind of a... The, the com not the comedy, but the old classic ninety the movie from the fifties where it's all a bit sort of jolly boys games. I had this discussion with Guy Walters in Greatest Escape Week about a year and a half ago, and I just think I wanted to make that point there. The prison of war camp life is not necessarily how it's portrayed in the movies. And then, then happy go back to you. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad you raised that point. I've talked about this with Paul Reed, and I think we mentioned it on one of the um, podcast things recently. 
And I, I made that point. I was quite frustrated by those images. And in fact, there are photographs of men, POWs and Stalag 4B dressed as women, entertaining the crowds. But as Ron makes out in his, uh, uh, points out, sorry, in his memoir, that those were, he, he describes them as RAF officers and they weren't expected to work. And I think that their conditions were better than Ron's. I'm not saying they were great, but they were better and they weren't forced to work. So, yeah, I think that's a, a really important, important point to raise. And, and thank you for that. No problem. So on slide six, they were promptly put in front of a firing squad. Ron then writes that the failed bevel said, if we did not go to work, he would order the guards to fire on us. But we all stood our ground, even though we all knew he was mad enough to do it. After lots of shouting, he backed down. He knew we had called his bluff. According to Ron, the South African doctor arrived 40 minutes later and confirmed that Ron's friend had been shot whilst lying face down at very close range. Ron writes, we went to his funeral the next day one of the few prisoners who had a proper grave in a German cemetery. I just want to point out there, actually, if I may, I, I did find um, a collection of photographs when on auction in 2018 um, that showed um, life in the camp in Stalag 4B. Um, it was a British man, I think, I'm not sure his surname was, I had it written down, it's disappeared. But anyway, he made a camera in the camp, he hollowed out a Bible, and he hid the camera in that Bible and he took a series of photographs and I can't show them because of copyright. But one of the photographs they show is um, of a, a, a British POW being given a funeral. And it makes the point in the article that um, was talking about these photographs. And I'll try and tweet the link later that this was a very rare occasion. Um, and that probably the POW had been suspected or alleged to have tried to escape. Um, um, but it may have been used as an excuse just to execute him. Um, so I do wonder whether that was the funeral of Ron's friend, but obviously I can't prove mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but what I do know is that Ron also witnessed the same failed bevel execute five American airmen. Next slide, please, Paul. He writes, when there was a big air raid taking place, failed bevel would order his guards that if any air crew bailed out and landed near the camp, not to take any prisoners, but to shoot them when they almost landed. This did happen one afternoon. Five Americans bailed out overhead and landed near the camp. The guards rounded them up and brought them to the camp. They would not kill them. But the Feld Bebel went mad. He pulled out his pistol and shot all five of the air crew. I was watching this happen through the window. Then he took all their flying jackets, watches, etc., from their bodies with the help of Popeye and left them where they lay. Later, a farmer came with a horse and cart. They loaded the bodies on and off the farmer went. And we reported this when we were freed. And Ron actually points out that he thinks they would have just been dumped into a pit. Wow. A person can develop PTSD days, months or years after having experienced a traumatic event. And symptoms of PTSD include nightmares. Since Ron experienced what any reader of his memoir would surely describe as stressful, frightening and distressing events during the Second World War and suffered from chronic nightmares thereafter, it seems reasonable to suggest that Ron may have suffered from PTSD. On treating patients suffering from PTSD, Chris R. Bruin, Professor of Clinical Psychology at University College London, argues that one of the most effective treatments is based on exposure, in which patients are required to deliberately and repeatedly rehearse their trauma memories in extreme detail. According to most standard theories of memory, this kind of rehearsal would be expected to strengthen the trauma memory representation and by extension to exacerbate the disorder, but the opposite is observed. According to Ron's immediate relatives, he rarely talked about his wartime experiences and the memoir that Diane encouraged him to write heralded an uncustomary period in his life in which he apparently abandoned trying to forget his trauma memories and deliberately tried to remember them. And I will explore the extent to which Ron might have remembered and the duration of his apparent remembering later in this paper. 
Exposing the trauma in order to enfeeble the children's memory is a therapeutic approach that can be traced back to the work of psychiatrist Dr. William Rivers. At Craig Lockhart War Hospital, Edinburgh, Rivers pioneered a radical new approach to the treatment of shell-shot soldiers of the First World War. Claire Fivey, consultant clinical psychologist and contemporary director of the Rivers Centre for Traumatic Stress, posits that Rivers was among the first to register how trauma memories work and consequently encouraged his patients not to repress their trauma memories, but rather to engage with them by talking about them. Next slide, please. The rad this radical new approach of Rivers is eulogized by the author Pat Barker in her novel Regeneration and Proceed here. Rivers treatment sometimes consisted of, sorry I've lost my place, uh, simply of encouraging the patient to abandon his hopeless attempt to forget and advising him instead to spend some part of every day remembering, neither brooding on the experience nor trying to pretend it had never happened. Usually, within a week or two of the patient starting this treatment, the nightmares began to be less frequent and less terrifying. Previously, treatment for shell-shocked soldiers included rest, feeding, massage, electrical applications, baths, and psychotherapy in the form of simple suggestion and occasional hypnosis. Next slide, please. I will now consider a paper Rivers co-authored for The Lancet in 1918, entitled An Address on the Repression of War Experience. Here, as well as discussing the evil influence of repression, he also discusses the attitude of patients to war memories and the extent to which suppression of traumatic war memories is encouraged by relatives, friends and medical advisors. Rivers claims that patients who have been treated elsewhere and not by him, have customarily been strictly forbidden to discuss the war with other patients or visitors and are instead instructed to lead their thoughts to other topics, to beautiful scenery and other pleasant aspects of experience. Rivers is at pains to point out here that he doesn't advocate dwelling on distressing memories, only that attempts to completely banish them should cease in order to achieve good effects. He then goes on to illustrate cases where the cessation of repression has resulted in renewed or improved mental well-being, as well as a case where he does not deem this approach applicable. The latter case, Pat Barker transformed into a character for regeneration, a character she named Burns. Burns, like the patient discussed by Rivers in his paper, had been thrown into the air by the explosion of a shell and had landed head first on a German corpse, whose gas-filled belly had ruptured on impact. When Rivers discusses this case, he concludes that cessation of repression is only successful where the memory has a redeeming feature or a strand that renders its contemplation endurable. But where the memory involves the mouth of an individual being filled with the decomposed entrails of an enemy soldier several days dead, Rivers can see that there is no redeeming feature and no contemplation of such a memory is endurable. Thus, in Burns' case, Rivers admits that the patient's symptoms were alleviated by retreating to a place far from war, such as the country, more so than by the cessation of repression and that consequently, cessation of repression was no longer advised. Before Diane encouraged Ron to think and then write about his traumatic experience, it seems that no other relative or friend had ever done the same. Both my granddads fought in the war. George Humphreys died the year before I was born, but the other, Albert Judd, lived until I was 18. Albert had been a gunner in the Royal Navy. Albert told me that following a series of intelligence tests, the Royal Navy considered him to be too gifted at maths to be a gunner. However, he insisted on this role because, as he put it, he just wanted to shoot the bastards. Albert lost his hearing in both ears as a result of manning the guns on deck, probably while serving on HMS Ajax. My mum recalls that, like Ron, her father never talked about his experience of war and gave his war medals to her and her siblings to play with. Consequently, Albert's war medals were eventually lost. 
suffering from lung cancer, Albert frequently came to stay with us during the last few years of his life. And I remember that on one occasion, he told me about a German attack on his ship. During the attack, Albert said that he ran to the ladder and joined the queue to reach the guns on the top deck. Once on the ladder, the sailor in front of him stopped climbing. He tugged the sailor's legs and shouted to him to hurry, but the sailor did not respond. He then discovered that the sailor had ceased climbing the ladder because he had been decapitated. Albert seemed disturbed not so much by the de decapitation itself, but by the fact that the sailor's body had remained fixed to the ladder following decapitation. He seemed unable to reconcile himself with this strange anomaly. I then questioned Albert about this experience and any others he had had, but thereafter, all he would share this period of his life was that his ship had created the beaches at Malta and that whilst there, he had eaten and enjoyed starfish fried in olive oil. Later, I relayed this story to my mum and she was astonished because she'd neither heard this story before nor known her father to ever talk about his war experiences. He had not even relayed happier memories such as the starfish cooked in olive oil. Mm. Returning to the subject of Rivers paper, I wonder to what extent the repression of Ron and Albert's traumatic war memories might have been accidental rather than deliberate. Encouragement to repress their war memories might simply have taken the form of Ron and Albert's loved ones failing to ask them any questions about their experiences when they returned home. Accordingly, the repression of traumatic war memories by Ron and Albert may have stemmed purely from the experience of never having to answer a question about their experience. Put simply, questions are not asked, so veteran does not speak, versus veteran appears not to speak, so questions are not asked. Slide 10, please, Paul. Unfortunately, I do not know how Albert was received as a returning veteran of war by his family and friends, but Ron writes, everywhere we went, we had a wonderful welcome. My future wife said that Aunt Lou, my grandmother, and her were going to give me a birthday party, 21st, a little late, but the first birthday party I had ever had. We all went up the West End of London most days and had very good times. In Oxford Street, there were lots of exhibitions about the war. The E came and this country became wild with excitement. Nobody had seen anything like this. It was quite unbelievable. Everybody was so happy. Flags were out everywhere. I would think this was the best time of most people's lives. Could it be that any desire Ron may have had to discuss his traumatic war experience upon returning home was vanquished by the celebratory mood of both his family and his nation? Kathy Carruth, Professor of English at Cornell University, posits another explanation. Concerned with Freud's attempt to explain the history of trauma and what it means to leave and to return to trauma, Carruth examines Freud's example of a train collision cited in his work, Moses a Monotheism. Here, Carruth is concerned with Freud's term latency, which she understands as the period following a traumatic event in which the effects of the experience are not apparent. Carruth suggests that the period of forgetting or latency by the individual who's walked away from the train collision seemingly unscathed occurs because they were never fully conscious during the accident itself. Further, since the traumatic event is not experienced as it occurs, it is fully evident only in connection with another place and in another time. I've recently been re-watching Band of Brothers, a series I return to time and again, and one with which I'm sure you're all familiar. But if you have the opportunity to revisit episode five, titled Crossroads, consider the scene in which Winters is traveling on the Metro in Paris. This scene takes place some months after he has killed a young SS soldier. For me, this scene offers a, offers a superb demonstration of Carruth's theory of latency. Returning to Ron, in his case then, perhaps the events he experienced as a combatant in the Second World War 
and later as a prisoner of war in Germany, were either not experienced by him as traumatic events or were not, or were not permitted to be experienced as traumatic events at the time they occurred. Perhaps these events only registered as being traumatic or were permitted to be acknowledged as traumatic when Ron was connected to another place and living in another time. For Ron, this place and this time might have been the care home he moved to during his dotage, for it, it was at this time that Ron's nightmares worsened and it mm. was at this place that group therapy was suggested and then organised in response to his troubled state of mind. I will now discuss the advent of British group therapy, its birthplace, architects and philosophy, before discussing the extent of Ron's participation in this therapeutic approach and its impact. In 1905, Holly Moore Hospital was built as an annex to the Rubri Hill Lunatic Asylum in Northfield, Birmingham. During the First World War, Rubri Hill and Holly Moore were commandeered by the British Army to treat over 21,000 wounded soldiers. In 1922, Holly Moore was returned to the city and reopened as a psychiatric hospital. But in 1942, Holly Moore was again requisitioned by the army and renamed the Northfield Military Hospital. The fundamental objective of Northfield was to rehabilitate soldiers suffering from neurosis, a condition Harrison describes as the unsung battle of the Second World War, and return them to military service within six weeks of admission. Where a soldier could not be rehabilitated or suitably redeployed, they were discharged from the army. During the Second World War, either at Northfield or elsewhere, such as in the emergency medical services hospitals, these were civilian hospitals initially commanded by the military to treat air raid victims, or the forward psychiatric units, these were early treatment cent uh, centres situated close to the front line, I'll talk about them later. The psychiatric treatments for neurosis ranged from the purely restorative and medically non-invasive, i.e. sleep, hot meals, showers and a change of kit, to the following. Continuous narcosis, a sedative treatment specifically for the shocked and shaking, which involved maintaining the patient in a semi-conscious state for a period of up to 10 days. Electroconvulsive therapy, the use of which, according to Harrison, increased during the war years at Northfield. Insulin therapy, a restorative therapy designed to fortify and fatten the debilitated soldier through the force feeding of sugar and later as a consequence of the nationwide food shortage, mashed potatoes. Narcoanalysis, a treatment that utilised barbiturates such as sodium amytal and pentothal to recover repressed traumatic memories, often used in combination with persuasion and or suggestion. Psychosurgery in the form of a leukotomy, which was a prefrontal lobotomy of the brain, although Harrison points out there's no clear evidence that leukotomies were performed at Northfield. Psychotherapy in the form of the talking cure is favoured by Rivers. Conditioning, whereby, for example, individuals hypersensitive to the noise of air raids were continually exposed to recordings of genuine warfare. Compulsory mourning, as I explained in my note in the title. Targeted individual therapies, for example, one patient was advised to kill the hospital cats in order to satisfy his homicidal feelings, while another patient was advised to read a novel on suicide during his initial psychiatric interview. Hypnotherapy, wow. yeah, I know. <laughs> Hypnotherapy, occupational therapy, such as embroidery and basket weaving, and most significantly, group therapy. Prior to the Second World War, only one psychiatrist, Austrian-born Dr. Joshua Beerer, is known to have been engaged in group therapy in Britain. According to Vera's obituary, he founded the first therapeutic community and developed the first day hospital at his social psychiatry centre in Hampstead, later known as the Marlborough Day Hospital. Here, Vera established small-scale informal groups where democratic values were promoted and communal activities such as cooking together and eating together were encouraged. Harrison states that during the Second World War, British military psychiatrists and psychologists assimilated observations of the importance of the group 
into their theoretical model of social integration. This is evident at Northfield, where in addition to Bira, the following preeminent psychiatrists and psychologists practiced at various period, uh, varying periods during the Second World War. John Rickman, Wilfred Bryan, Michael Folkes, Harold Bridger, Tom Main, Pat DeMare, and Sergeant Lawrence Bradbury. In 1942, Bryan and Rickman conducted the first Northfield experiment. This experiment explored group dynamics and encouraged the formation of leaderless groups that were free from the direction, instruction of the attending psychiatrist. Such an approach put the onus on the neurotic patient to make decisions regarding their day-to-day -day activities and encouraged them to reflect upon the consequences of their decisions. Bynum and Rickman's expectation was that this process of decision making and subsequent reflection would enable the patient to reclaim their independence and by extension life. Harrison reports that the experiment failed to establish any permanent gain, but did establish the principles upon which subsequent work is built. The second Northfield experiment began in 1944. Folks, Main, Bridger and Bradbury expanded group therapy to accommodate a hospital as a whole philosophy. Under this approach, therapeutic ventures flourished and Nissan huts were provided to facilitate the following activities, woodwork, toy making, modeling, theater, sculpture, pottery, radio construction, gardening, building construction, band practice, and with the encouragement of Sergeant Bradbury, art. I will consider Bradbury's contribution to art therapy in greater depth when I return to the subject of Ron's geriatric care and his personal experience of group therapy. In addition to these therapeutic activities, patients secured work placements at the nearby Austin Motor Company, the Avoncroft Agricultural College and various local shops. Furthermore, they regularly enjoyed dances, walks, cinema visits and picnics organised by a legion of both fascinated and sympathetic local women. Together, these initiatives helped to raise the status of Northfield beyond that of just another psychiatric hospital treating sufferers of war neurosis to a full-blown therapeutic institute. Next slide, please, Paul. Main stated, the transition of the patient from a passive recipient of care regarded as good as long as they conform to dictates of the institution into an active partner in therapy, making decisions about what form it was to take, challenging previous ideas and taking power and responsibility in the process of their recovery was revolutionary. While Ron was resident in a geriatric care home, he also attended group therapy where old soldiers and young soldiers convened to both speak and draw their trauma. Returning to the subject of art therapy, the late historian Ben Shepherd maintained that Northfield Sergeant Bradbury was a significant figure in the origin of art therapy, although art therapy was not a recognisable profession until 1964. Of his work at Northfield, Bradbury later stated, I had this little hut of mayhem. It was really a sort of anarchy. I was just one of them, painting with them. There was no instruction given. The general attitude in the heart was that they could be themselves and God knows they needed to be. Many of them were still trying to cope with the guilt of killing or of not being killed if their chums were. All these things came out in pictures. Ron's attendance at the art therapy group was ephemeral. He disapproved of the bad language used by his young counterparts and did not want to talk about the war. This is ironic since Ron had a propensity for colourful language. Instead, Ron wanted to talk about his late wife and became frustrated with the group when his attempts to do so were discouraged. Perhaps as an act of rebellion, the only picture Ron drew in the period he attended the group was of a plant in a plant box. Contemporary art therapist Kimberly Smith states that art therapists treating the elderly represent two therapeutic approaches. The first approach emphasises the importance of art making as a therapeutic activity, while the second uses the artefact in combination with the patient and therapist to arrive at psychoanalytically based interpretations. 
Ultimately, the aim of both approaches is to elevate the unconscious feeling to a greater position of consciousness. Smith goes on to discuss the art therapy given to an elderly man named Albert. Suffering from war-related PTSD, Albert was encouraged to use art as a medium for rethinking his wartime experiences. Initially, Albert, like Ron, was reluctant to turn artist. Indeed, his first painting was of a tree. However, the difference between Albert and Ron was that Albert persisted with not just the art therapy, but also the psychotherapy, attending many sessions of each and producing many paintings. Smith reports that eventually, Albert learned to have trust and faith in the therapy process and reported a reduction in anxiety as a result. Since Ron refused to speak about his traumatic war memories, refused to draw them and wrote about them only once and then solely at the bidding of another, it raises a question concerning the degree to which Ron ceased to repress his traumatic war memories. Diane recalls that when Ron finished writing about his experience of war, he declared that he would not speak of nor be questioned about it again. In turn, this leads me to question the extent to which Ron apparently remembered his war memories and the duration of this apparent remembering. Where improved mental well-being can be achieved by translating traumatic experiences into language, i.e. by writing them down, the efficacy of this therapeutic approach is, according to Pennebaker, also governed by the duration of the writing itself. Research suggests that writing about a traumatic event once a week over a period of one month is more effective than writing about it four times in a single week. Though we do know that Ron wrote his memoir on varying sizes and types of paper, and this in itself, I would argue, suggests that he did not write his memoir in one sitting, we do not know whether Ron wrote over a number of consecutive days or wrote sporadically over a number of weeks since Diane was not present when he wrote. What is clear is that Ron's approach to the task of writing a memoir and the subsequent duration of remembering required to produce the memoir might have made its benefits negatory if it was written in a condensed period of time. Slide 12, please, Paul. Earlier in this paper, I mentioned that Ron's memoir was written entirely in block capitals. This slide shows an extract of Ron's memoir. I submitted this page to graphologist Sheila Lowe. Lowe is a court qualified forensic handwriting examiner with over 40 years of experience in the field. She has testified in cases of forgery and regularly conducts personality assessments of alleged offenders for the American judicial system. She's an author of various books on handwriting analysis and has taught the subject at the University of California. My motivation for submitting this sample to Lowe was to ascertain what, if anything, Ron's handwriting signified, since to write entirely in block capitals struck me as unusual. Lowe responded, there's a lot more to look at than your uncle's block printing in this sample. The extremely close space, the strongly slanted T-bars, etc. But overall, what it tells me is that he had a strong need to feel in control because inside he felt that otherwise he would just lose it. Uh, slide 13, please, Paul. Block printing and experiencing severe nightmares as a result of war trauma, as Ron did, is reminiscent of a character named Billy Pryor in Pat Barker's novel, Regeneration. Pryor is a second lieutenant of the First World War and is treated by a therapist named Rivers for mutism. He also suffers from nightmares so bad that his roommate was getting no sleep. Initially, Pryor provides answers to Rivers' questions in their therapy sessions by writing them on a notepad. This is interesting because the questions Rivers asks are concerned with discovering the specifics of Pryor's nightmares. And Pryor's written responses to Rivers' questions are always expressed in block capitals. For example, following a nightmare, Rivers asks Pryor, what did you dream about? 
Pryor writes, I don't remember. When Rivers maintains that in order to treat Pryor successfully, he must know what happened to him in France, Pryor repeats, I don't remember. Then, when Rivers insists that Pryor's memory will start to come back, Pryor responds, no more words. In other words, Pryor wants to keep control of his memory and does not want to remember what took place in France. Incidentally, avoidance and emotional numbing is a symptom of PTSD. I was also struck by Rivers' observation regarding Pryor's use of block capitals. Rivers asks, why do you always write in block capitals? Because it's less revealing. But Pryor rejects Rivers' hypotheses and writes clearer. However, I will now show that ordinarily Pryor does not write in block capitals, and as such, Rivers' hypotheses that Pryor's use of block capitals signifies a repressed trauma is not without substance. Slide 14, please, Paul. Regeneration is the first of three novels by Pat Barker featuring Rivers and Pryor. The last, The Ghost Braid, shows Pryor preparing to return to France, having received treatment for war neurosis, even though the reader is told he could remain on permanent home service as a consequence of his lifelong asthma. Pryor buys a diary with marbled covers and thick creamy pages from a stationer's near Fleet Street. There, he records not only his return to France, but also his experience of combat in France, writing his first diary entry on the 29th of August 1918 and his last on the 3rd of November 1918. Furthermore, on the 2nd of November 1918, he pens a letter to Rivers in which he states, my nerves are in perfect working order. The significant feature of each of Pryor's diary entries and his letter to Rivers is that each word is written in lowercase. In regeneration, Pryor represses traumatic events and writes in block capitals. In The Ghost Road, Pryor does not repress traumatic events and writes in lowercase. According to Lowe, Ron's block printing is evidence that he had a strong need to feel in control because inside he felt that otherwise he would just lose it. I've already suggested that Ron had a strong need to control what he felt about his experience of combat but also what he was prepared to reveal about this period of his life. And therefore, Lowe's analysis of Ron's writing, I think, has real resonance. So far, I have revealed that the true function of Ron's memoir, as far as his daughter is concerned, was to provide Ron with catharsis, rather than, as Ron believed, to provide subsequent generations with his war testimony. I have also shown that Ron's abortive participation in group therapy as an elderly man was arranged by others in a bid to relieve the debilitating symptoms of his repressed traumata. Further, I've questioned the extent to which Ron ceased to repress his traumata by emphasizing his refusal to speak it, draw it, or write it more than once. However, the following question remains, why, even in later life, when Ron was actively encouraged to disclose his traumata, was he unable to do so? In an attempt to answer this question, I will now hypothesize that not only did Ron suffer an episode of war neurosis on the battlefield during the Allied invasion of Italy, but also that the ensuing medical treatment initiated the lifelong repression of not only this traumatic event, but each of those later traumatic events suffered by Ron as a POW in Germany. Our next slide, please, Paul. Ron's memoir reveals that he joined the Middlesex Regiment in January 1941, but was transferred to the London Irish Rifles, then the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, followed by the Royal Ulster Rifles. A series of transfers Diane attributes to Ron having been a naughty boy. In 1937, the London Irish Rifles became a Territorial Army Battalion of the Royal Ulster Rifles. During the Second World War, the London Irish Rifles, the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers and the Royal Ulster Rifles formed an Irish Brigade and served with distinction in, among others, the Italian campaigns. In January 1944, Ron landed in Naples. According to his memoir, two weeks were spent barracked in the city of Nola, 
before the journey to the front began. Ron describes Nola as a nice little town, not far from the front, where we could hear the guns and see the flashes quite clearly. During the march to the front, Ron reports that his unit was strafed by German aircraft and also that they had to cross only partially cleared minefields. Ron goes on to describe the front in conjunction with a mountainous area and recalls that it was necessary to wait for some royal engineers to facilitate the crossing of the river Garigliano. Following the river crossing, Ron travelled to battalion headquarters. Ron's VHQ consisted of a barn housing a first aid post staffed by a medical officer and two male nurses and a small farmhouse within the range of fire. Ron's timeline, together with the description of his BHQ, appears to correspond with that posited by the London Irish Rifles Association, when it states that in January 1944, the London Irish Rifles established themselves in a farmhouse about a thousand yards from the banks, roughly midway between the River Garigliano and Monte Damiano. In fact, easily observed by the Germans, the farmhouse was heavily shelled and sustained several direct hits. During one such barrage, Ron's unit were ordered to take up positions in front of the farmhouse. Not surprisingly, Ron was caught in an explosion and knocked unconscious. Apart from a temporary loss of consciousness, Ron does not indicate that he sustained any other physical injury. Slide 16, please. He writes, from this point, my memory is not very good. All I know is the Germans put down a very heavy barrage. This was coming in very near us. After this, I remember coming to in the first aid post. There were a few of us. I had a label tied on my tunic and this stated very near an explosion. I know I was in a very shocked state. An American ambulance picked about six of us up, including an Italian who had lost both of his eyes. Ron does not articulate the appearance, form or symptoms of his very shocked state. However, Ron does write that he knows he was in a very shocked state. The writing of the word no is significant, for it suggests that Ron's trauma was sufficiently acute as to render it manifest even to him. Furthermore, Ron's use of the modifier very to his shocked state followed by a sentence which features an Italian man with no eyes, is further evidence that this particular shock or trauma was severe. The inclusion of the following caveat, from this point, my memory is not very good, further substantiates my hypotheses that Ron suffered from war neurosis, since, as I've previously stated, an inability to recall significant details of a trauma is a primary symptom of war neurosis. Ron's ability to recall that the ambulance was American, the casualties numbered six, and the specific nature of the wounds suffered by the Italian suggests that the missing details, i.e. the appearance, form, or symptoms of his very shocked state are the consequence of repression rather than amnesia. Following the explosion, Ron writes that he regained consciousness in the first aid post. Since Ron lost consciousness at the front of the farmhouse BHQ, it is reasonable to deduce that the first aid post to which Ron refers was the one located in the nearby aforementioned barn. Slide 17, please, Paul. Once Ron is collected by the American ambulance, he is then taken to another first aid post. This house was full of wounded, waiting to be taken back behind the front line. This was not an easy task because of the river behind us. Again, the REs were able to put up a bridge in the darkness. This we were taken over by ambulance to another hospital, temporary. There I was examined and sent a good way back to another hospital. This was under canvas and quite a long way from the front. And next slide, please, Paul. During the Italian campaign, the army de uh, developed a three-tier casualty system. Casualties requiring no more than two to five days rest were subject to forward treatment near the front line, while those requiring 10 to 14 days rest were taken further back to receive more sophisticated treatment. Serious cases, i.e. psychiatric cases, were transported to base psychiatric centres for psychiatric treatment far from the front line. 
At the time of Vaughan's very shocked state in January 1944, Major Harold Palmer was the chief psychiatrist at a base psychiatric centre located in the two general hospital, Caserta, Italy. As the crow flies, the distance from Caserta to Nola, the town close to the front where Vaughan was initially barracked, is approximately 15 miles, and from Caserta to Monte Damiano, the latter location being the most likely location of one's VHQ and thus trauma, is approximately 32 miles. Prior to being appointed chief psychiatrist at Two General Hospital, Palmer ran a newly established forward psychiatric unit in Tripoli, Libya. Palmer, described as a tough, no-nonsense northerner, formidably well-trained in general medicine, but vehemently opposed to psychoanalysis, treated a third of the 12,000 soldiers in his care with the simple restorative approach of sleep, hot meals, showers, and a change of kit. In fact, these words were Palmer's own, just as this approach was his design. Uh, slide 19, please, Paul. Palmer believed that no soldier, neurotic or otherwise, deserved special treatment. Why should the neurotic be safeguarded against the nervous breakdown any more than the ordinary soldier is safeguarded against the risk of wounding or death? A community at war has as much right to demand that a soldier gives his nerves for his country as in principle it exercises the right to demand that a soldier gives his eyes, limbs or even his life for his country. Where this approach failed, Palmer employed a combination of sedation, ether of reaction, and a style of persuasion that was both intense and prosecuted with vigour. In January 1944, the same month and year Ron experienced his very shocked state, comedian and writer Spike Milligan, fighting in the same region as Ron, experienced war neurosis. The quote I'm about to read of Milligan's is taken from a frosty letter of reply that Milligan wrote a well-meaning fan named Stephen Gard in February 1977. Gard had originally written to Milligan regarding the third volume of his memoirs titled Monty, His Part of My Victory. Gard asked Milligan, why do so many goon shows, e.g. Tales of Men's Shirts, harp on the theme of military cowardice? After the line, the prison camp was filled with British officers who'd sworn to die rather than be captured, audience laughter, why did you come to the mic and say, thank you, fellow cowards? Is it because you yourself were accused of this? Slide 20, please, Paul. Milligan replied, another thing that bothers you is cowardice in the face of the enemy. Well, the point is, I suffered from cowardice in the face of the enemy throughout the war. In the face of the enemy, also in the legs, the elbows and the wrists. In fact, after two years in the front line, a mortar bomb exploded by my head. Or was it my head exploded by a mortar bomb? And it so frightened me, I put on a tremendous act of stammering, stuttering and shivering. This, mixed with cries of mother and a free flow of dysentery, enabled me to be taken out of the line and downgraded to B2. But for that brilliant performance, this letter would be coming to you from a grave in Italy. Any more questions from you, and our friendship is at an end. The final mm -hmm. line of Milligan's letter is reminiscent of Ron's declaration that once he'd finished writing about his experience of war, he was not to be questioned about it again. Rather like Ron, Milligan also describes the recall of his breakdown as very bitty. Harrison reports that it was usual for the soldier to have lost all memory of the events leading up to his breakdown. Milligan was sent to two general hospital and was interviewed by Palmer. Following an unspecified period on the ward reading poetry, Milligan told Palmer that he no longer wanted to take up bed space. Palmer replied, I appreciate that. A lot of the bastards like to malinger here as long as they can. Engineer Matthew Salmon's experience of Palmer was decidedly more caustic. Indeed, it could be argued that Palmer persecuted Salmon with vigour. Following a bombardment near the Rapido River, in which Salmon was very lucky to escape with his life, he experienced difficulty speaking and developed a stammer. 
Following three days of unsuccessful treatment in a field hospital, he was moved further back to two general hospital where his nervous state was treated by Palmer. Salmon reports that during the treatment, Palmer shouted at him, questioned him repeatedly and accused him of lying about his traumatic experience at the front. Salmon states, I just couldn't make Palmer understand that I was telling the truth and the difficulty I was having with my speech made things even more distressing. Eventually, Palmer administered sodium amytal and put Salmon to sleep for a total of two weeks. Since Ron fought in the same region of Italy as both Milligan and Salmon, and at the same time, i.e. January 1944, if, as I suspect, he experienced an episode of war neurosis, was he treated at two general hospital and might he have suffered Palmer? Slide 21, please, Paul. Ron was moved back to receive medical treatment for his very shocked state a total of three times. If the three-tier casualty system implemented by the army during the Italian campaign is applied to Ron's case, it suggests that Ron was eventually moved back to a base psychiatric centre. As I've already established, the base psychiatric centre for the region of Italy where Ron was fighting was the two general hospital run by Palmer. Like Salmon, Ron writes that at the final hospital, he was put to sleep. The hospital was where I had the best sleep of my life. I was put to sleep for 72 hours. When I came to, I had a nice wash and shave, a new uniform, etc., and felt a new man. A few days later, I was sent back to my unit. Ron does not mention undergoing any form of psychiatric interview as part of the treatment for his very short state, but at the hospital he describes as temporary, he does reveal that he was examined before being sent further back to the hospital where he was put to sleep. Elsewhere in this paper, I've established that continuous narcosis was A, a psychiatric treatment for war neurosis, and B, a treatment prescribed following a psychiatric interview. That Ron suffered war neurosis as a combatant in Second World War now seems more than likely. Unfortunately, I've been unable to determine whether Ron was psychologically assessed by Palmer or received continuous narcosis at two general hospital. Ron stated that his treatment at the final hospital was under canvas. Photographs of two general hospital reveal that canvas tents did grace the hospital grounds. Meanwhile, in his scholarly monograph, A War of Nerves, Soldiers and Psychiatrists, 1914 to 1994, Shepard refers to a film that recorded the arrival of acute battlefield casualties at an exhaustion centre near Rome in May 1944. Exhaustion centres assessed and identified those who would recover quickly with rest, sedation, general hygienic measures and simple psychotherapeutic measures. These included cases of physical exhaustion, the less severe anxiety states and mild hysterical conditions. The remainder were evacuated to the advanced based psychiatric units. He describes this exhaustion centre as an arbitrary collection of tents in an anonymous Italian landscape and categorises it as the first tier of the three-tier casualty system. Here, the casualties received the simple treatment of a psychiatric interview, followed by a three-day period of sleep. Shepherds adds that by the third day, the mild anxiety cases look completely recovered and are on their way back to the front. Having considered Ron's treatment and the purpose and practice of each tier of the three-tier casualty system, I cannot determine if Ron received treatment for his very short state at an exhaustion centre or a base psychiatric centre. What I have been able to establish is that these words of Ron's, when I came to, I had a nice wash and shave, a new uniform, etc., and felt a new man, are a paraphrase of Palmer's sleep, hot meals, showers, and a change of kit. Palmer was adamant that no neurotic soldier be permitted to think of themselves as a sick man. The interviews Harrison conducted with former Northfield patients led him to conclude that the majority found it difficult to report on their personal experiences of breakdown. Ron's inability to elucidate this traumatic event, even 50 years later, signifies a mind well-versed in silence and sickness and a body that was never permitted to bloody well cry. Um, Paul, would you rather ask questions now, or shall I go to my reading? Um, go to go to your reading. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll then we'll do questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to conclude this paper with a short reading from my novel, The Other Way, 
The other way is to be published by Hobart Book in 2023. Um, but first, a bit of background on the story, otherwise you won't know the point of what I'm reading. Um, Alfie Edwards is a POW in a German labour camp. Following the Allied firebombing of Dresden in February 1945, Alfie is forced to assist in the cleanup operation. He's made to recover the dead from the rubble and deliver them to a designated pyre in the middle of the street. In the basement of a ruin, he discovers the body of a baby wearing a soiled nappy and the tattered remains of a lemon-coloured nightie. Before delivering the baby to the pyre, he tidies her nightdress and in so doing, dislodges a button. He drops the button into his pocket to save it from becoming lost in the thick layer of human fat that covers the basement floor and then cradles her as he once cradled his newborn son, Harry. Alfie witnesses many violent deaths as a combatant and POW, but it is this moment, the moment with the baby in the basement, that grows stronger than his mind. Prior to the outbreak of war, Alfie is a man who stores all his energy in the soles of his feet and moves like a young leaf blasted by the wind. He sings and whistles even as he cleans his teeth. He dances, tells jokes, dreams of extending his family, and when not with his wife, Lil, imagines the passionate reunion with her. But following the moment where he discovers the body of the baby, he resembles a decomposed moth and wishes he hadn't survived the war. This extract is titled The Homecoming and does, I hope, demonstrate the point I was making earlier, that the repression of traumatic war memories may stem from never being questioned about those experiences by the people to whom they returned. I just got to quickly wet my whistle. No problem. Fantastic stuff. Okay. So we've got the slide up, haven't we, in Homecoming? Alfie knocks on the front door of his parents' house and waits on the step. It is summer and their small front garden smells overwhelmingly of mint. The street is full of English voices, tunes being whistled, children playing hopscotch and the sound of drowsy bees. A bleeding heart is in bloom beneath the bay window among a tangle of stinging nettles. The doorstep is dusty and the nets at the open windows look grey. He wears American clothes in shades of brown that are made of rayon and make him sweat. He hears his father say faintly, was that the door? See, will you, Lil? He steps forward to look through the stained glass panel. The wallpaper on the hall walls is the same orange patterned paper that Fred put up in 1932. The shape of a child appears. The child speaks. I think there's a man at the door, mummy. Harry. Then he hears the sing-song voice of a much younger child call out, There's a man at the door, mummy. Maggie. Alfie walks back down the path to wait at the gate. I just said that, Maggie, shouts Harry. I just said that, shouts Maggie, laughing. Not again, sighs Harry. Mummy! Don't start, the pair of you, warns Lil. Maggie's copying me again. Not, says Maggie, joining him in the hall. Yes, you are, says Harry. You said there was a man at the door after I said it. Lil comes down the stairs feeling hot and bothered. Shall I find you both a job to do? Is that what you want? Yes, please, says Maggie. No, thank you, says Harry. Go and play, she orders, but they don't. She opens the door and sees Alfie standing at the gate. It's almost three years since they last saw each other. Harry, now aged four years and five months, and Maggie, now aged two years and one month, hide behind her wide skirt and wait for their mother to speak to the man. Lil doesn't know what to say, so she just says, hello, Alfie. Her response seems inadequate, even to her but it is all she's capable of. Harry knows a man called Alfie. It's the name of his dad. Granddad Fred talks about Alfie, his dad, all the time. But this Alfie doesn't look anything like his dad. In the hand-coloured photograph, his dad has yellow hair and pink cheeks and all of his teeth. 
He worries he might have to kiss this man. He covers his mouth with his mother's skirt. Maggie has no idea who the tall old man at the gate is. She doesn't recognise the name or the face. She copies Harry and wonders where the pudgy stuff that should be under the man's skin has gone. She'd quite like to pinch what's left or to prod it at the very least. She thinks it will feel squashy like dough. Alfie sees three uncertain faces and wonders whether it might not have been better for everyone if he just told the German guard that he was hot. He was hot. He warns himself not to think about that day, but in so doing signals begin to another barrage of one particular thought, sticky skin. He tries to replace the thought with commands such as move, smile and speak. But then the thought that has ruined everything returns because Maggie is wearing a yellow dress. He is reminded of the baby in the basement and of her sticky skin. He clutches his trousers to feel rayon in place of her flesh. He feels the outline of a small button in his pocket. He clutches his shirt sleeves. He doesn't know what else to do. Lil thinks Alfie looks like a decomposed moth. She releases the children from her skirt and pushes them back into the house, quietly ordering them to go and play. For once, Harry is happy to do as he is bid. He takes Maggie's hand and drags her into the hallway, promising to build her a den in the garden using the clothes walls and a blanket. Lil steps out of the house, pulls the door behind her and says, do you want to come inside? He ignores the invitation. I'm smiling, he says. She frowns because he isn't smiling and hasn't smiled in all the times been standing by the gate. She doesn't know what to do or what to say. She thinks she should walk to the gate and offer him her hand, but she also knows that she won't. I'm not myself, he says. I'm not right anymore. She waits for further information. I can't touch things now. She remembers him as a child collecting furry orange and black caterpillars in a bucket for no other reason than to see how many he could find in one day. 53. She was able to help him locate the caterpillars, but she hadn't wanted to pick them up. She also remembers him burying a decomposing magpie by the railway line with his bare hands and dangling a slow worm in front of her face. She tries to think what these things might be, but nothing comes to mind. She finds herself saying, things before she can stop herself. He feels a sudden rush of heat to his head and a dreadful sensation that he's about to faint. He puts his hand on the garden wall and stares at his feet. People, he says. She wonders whether she counts as people. She reminds herself that she is a person, even if she's not a very nice one, and says, you're home now, Alfie. That's all that matters. He panics because he doesn't think she's understood what he's trying to tell her. I'm not normal, he says, holding out the palms of his hands as if to show her the sticky skin that covers them. He crouches down and puts his head between his knees. She's had enough. Neither is she. Neither is she, if you must know. What makes him so special? She glances at the open windows and says quietly, we can suit ourselves. But she folds her arms and waits. But I'm... She pushes open the front door with the heel of her foot and says, Come inside now, Alfie. I'm putting the kettle on. We usually have a cup of tea about now. That's it. Thank you. I've got one final slide there, Paul. Yeah, that was amazing, Victoria. Yeah, wow. Um, phew. just um, take processing all that now. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll have to take a minute or two to think about that. But yeah, we're, we're obviously looking at the photos of Ron there. So, um, yeah. Well, folks, we'll do questions now. Um, I took a moment to just recover from that. That was um, you, you, you got me there. You got me somewhere. I don't know where you Aww. got me. That was amazing. Yeah, I, was, I was quite worried about getting through it without getting upset myself. It's yeah, it's a difficult piece. 
No, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, so many things. I've, I've jotted down some ideas and some questions. Obviously, people are going to have some questions from the, from the, for the viewers as well. But, I mean, um, I, the, the, I've, these are kind of randomly as I've, as I've written them down. So one of the things that you, when you were saying about people coming back, the, the, VA, the VE day excitement, I think, is interesting. I also wonder whether everybody end of World War II has spent the last six years in Britain with this whole careless talk costs lives issue of don't ask anybody anything. Now, I know that's nothing to do with people's mental health, but I wonder whether the entire nation, and that would apply to other nations, are so attuned to not asking anybody anything because of security that when a veteran comes back who doesn't want to talk about things, that's their reaction. Well, perhaps he was doing something secret. Perhaps I, can't, I shouldn't push it because I, 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 that was one thing that occurred to me. Um, the other thing that the, the, my random thought is about the group therapy sessions at the, reti at the retirement home, about the fact that he wanted to talk about his wife and he didn't like the fact it was bad language, even though he used bad language. And, and then later when you said about the, the capital letters and the capitalization, the control, whether that he was wanting to control those therapy sessions, the group that into what he wanted them to be, not necessarily what was better for him. So, so there, there are a couple of the ideas I, I've, I've written down. Um, but I, I want to uh, um, uh, applaud you for trying to, to get to some kind of, albeit imperfect conclusion as to what John uh, Ron's journey was all about. You know, the, the fact you can't be certain about the hospital, but there's a lot of connections with Palmer there. And some com com uh, comments came up there about, about his his approach in that it seems he's somewhere between getting it right in a revolutionary advanced way, but also a little bit guilty of kind of tough love and kind of quite kind of forward thinking, but in the wrong way, maybe, but was tougher than others. Um, that's just my the random thoughts. Um, yeah. Um, and I think that's fair, isn't it? Because I think whenever we come, whatever, whenever we come to any career, we always bring our past, our own upbringing with us, don't we? And, you know, I don't know anything about Tom. I haven't looked into him. But as you said, that's I think that's always the trouble that you could, when you're looking at things in isolation, there you could be unfair. Um, so yeah, I'm I, I think what the audience have noted there is that there is the sense he's trying to do the right thing, but he might not necessarily be going about it always in the right way. Um, I did a lot of study on a a, a physician called Yelland. He's Canadian. And um, he was um, kind of really shown by um, um, Pat Barker and Re Regeneration to be this kind of this, this terrible physician who really got a kick out of um, putting his patients through electrotherapy. Um, but a lot of current physicians who have studied all the medical records at Queen Square have pointed out that actually what he was doing was in line with the way that people were treated back then and that while some patients did experience some pain whilst being treated by Yelland, many turned out for his funeral and many felt that they that he treated them with care and and for example Yelland also didn't worry about class so he treated the the lowly soldier as well um, for want of a better word so yeah I think I think it's a good point that the audience have raised there um with Bernard we don't know exactly what he was like we can only go by I mean, I've just picked Spike Milligan's um, reaction, Salmon's reaction, and I don't have one from Ron. So, yeah, that's fair. Mm. And, you know, it, I think people are watching this who've, who've got different histories and books. You know, various units in World War II divisions were trying different techniques with people. The language was different, you know, battle fatigue. I remember in the 29th Division, American 29th Division, they called it, when people were showing kind of minor signs, they called it the wobbles or something. And those people were given a duty with the chaplain for two or three days. Yeah. Just kind of be in, a, in with someone who would talk about the bigger picture and we're just pawns in a big game and don't, don't stress the big stuff. But I'm sure people can think watching can think of other units that they they're familiar with who were trying different things. And the point about trying different things is that you have to find, sometimes find what doesn't work first to then find out what works. And uh, people have been saying, we're still learning about PTS. And there's the debate about, is it even a syndrome? Now, PTSD, as you said, came in in 98, 1980. But I feel we're on the brink of a new word coming in to replace PTSD because I had, I forget which show I was doing fairly recently. Um, 
Oh, it was with Marcus Brotherton about the book he wrote, A Bright a Shining Sun, about the guy he wrote about. He doesn't like PTSD because syndrome implies it's something unusual. But his point is that having neuroses from war is the normal reaction to seeing something like this. And so calling it a, so there's lots of things. And I think um, when you said at the beginning about um, you've not been through a war, like I've not been through a war, Paul Reed's not been through a war, Brad Sanquois's not been through a war. All we can do is try and learn from the people who have been through wars and written about it and talked about it, accepting that we don't know everything. Um, we have a question from, uh, I've got to go back and find it there, from Phil Bosworth saying, uh, has this whole experience affected you, Victoria? This the the, the in, in terms of going through Ron's trauma, yeah. yes, definitely. I think, um, so just very briefly, what happens, I did my MA and I wrote a dissertation on the Troubles, actually, because I used to live in Northern Ireland. I've always been very interested in that conflict. Um, and I was awarded a PhD kind of on the proviso that I explored the backstory of a character from this story I'd written about the Troubles. And I thought, well, this character... Uh, in the troubles, he does very. He has a very extreme response to the murder of his partner, and it's it's, it's super extreme. Uh, so, so what would need to have happened to him in order to respond in that way? So, I started to think about war trauma and looking at these ideas that you know the trauma can tr be transmitted to the second and third generations. And this kind of led me to think, well, you know, I need to think about Alfie's story. What happened to him in the war? And you know, this was then why I went to my to my aunt and asked for this account. So before I did that, I knew very little about Ron's experience of the war. Um, and so, you know, spending three years kind of reading about war trauma, reading novels about war trauma, as well as monographs, as well as psychiatric reports, all of these things. I do, you know, sometimes it was very upsetting and it was hard going. The one thing as I've always, when I've taught creative writing, I've learned it, I've taught it, and I tell students, is that, you know, there, there has to be light as well as shade. And so with the novel the other way, it's very easy to think, well, that's what that whole novel's like. It's going to reduce you potentially to tears on every page. It won't. You know, it's, it's very much written um, with humour, because I think that whenever we experience trauma, we do also experience lighter moments. Um, so it was a difficult period. So it did affect me. I, I, I definitely think it affected me. Um, and I would say that during that period, I, I would say I was particularly miserable, but it was there was a sadness and I definitely took that on. And I, you know, I still feel that. Um, and I went, especially when I think about Ron and the fact that, you know, I probably would never have spoken to him anyway because I wouldn't have wanted to upset him. But the thought that I've been in a room with somebody who's experienced that and been so traumatised by it and I've gone about my day, it, it's quite difficult. Mm. No, I mean, you're, and you're, you're raising the point that we, we did on the podcast with Paul Reid again is that for those of us who are watching, talking and watching this, you know, we, we like talking about the what should General so-and-so have done on July the so-and-so and we debate the... The, the which equipment should have been used and should they have been better if they attacked the left hand flank or the right flank we, who made what mistakes that's still that it, the analysis we're doing about World War II but I think those of us that, that enjoy that and I think enjoy isn't an inappropriate word to talk about that should also be reminded that for the participants in these events um, they, they may not have had the ability to spend time talking about the the rights and wrongs of combat decisions because they, they were facing just the fact they had to live through this shit. And, 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 and I think that's an important reminder in all these channels that, that on YouTube, including my own, where we're talking about the gear and the tech and the battles and maneuvers and divisions that there, there's this, this human element that mustn't be, mustn't be forgotten. Um, so, and I, I, I think, um, because someone asked me, Andrew, I think it was, said, "Am I going to have Victoria back on when your when your novel is ready?" And 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 I said, "Yes, maybe." Because I'm keep I'm, I'm I keep getting asked about why I don't bring more people on who do historical fiction. I'm getting I get an email about that probably every week, and partly is because I don't want to kind of open the floodgates, <laughs> and suddenly it becomes about a, a literary show as opposed to a history show. But also, um, I, I sometimes I don't kind of see the point with historical fiction in some regards in that 
why research something and make something up when you could be doing the real research in the real but it seems to me you've brought those two worlds together and that you've done the genuine research and then you've obviously well, the reading you did there's a lot of ron now we can hear in in your character there there's a lot of what you've learned you've presented to us you put in that that passage there so you've you've blended real research with a with a with a fictionalized way of dealing with it so that you said you can you can bring in the elements you want so that's given me something to think about the historical fiction aspect as well so so thanks for that um you're welcome but, um they were just saying fantastic presentation and uh amazing presentation so um yeah i mean is this you, you know you you talk about this paper you did the presentation now is is your study into ron over or are you still is it still something that you're thinking about as things come along i think i mean i i finished um my phd in 2016 so that was really the time when i i stopped researching um ron um but obviously prepare sort of speaking to doing those podcasts with yourself and paul reed has kind of got me thinking about ron again and finding out more stuff about him um in terms of uh, writing historical fiction, the the other way there is there is I do plan to write a sequel, but it's not to do with Ron. It's to consider that his grandson's reaction to trauma. So thinking about Ron, and then we have Harry's response, which is covered in this novel. And then right at the end of this novel, we start thinking about LJ, the grandson, and what happened to him. And that would be a, a, a novel that centers on the troubles conflict. So it would be about conflict again, but obviously a more contemporary conflict. Um, so I think that I've kind of left researching Ron here for now. Um, I'm currently also doing some research into writers who were veterans in Second World War who wrote for children. I don't think Paul Reed will mind me saying this. We're working on something together. So again, analyzing texts and looking at those authors and their uh, their experience as a combatant in Second World War and trying to understand why they were writing for children. Wow. Wow. So um, so I think I'm, I'm very much trapped in the world of World War II. It's funny because when you do creative writing, I remember somebody saying to me, creative writers have a period in history in which they are most comfortable uh, being. And somebody said to me, and yours is clearly World War II. And I refuted that because I hadn't actually written much about World War II then. Um, but now that I've, I've been in this world to write the other way, I then penned another novel, which is being published next year, called Not the Work of an Ordinary Boy. That's very much set in the run-up to Normandy and just after the Normandy campaign, Operation Overlord. Now I'm writing a sequel to Not the Work of an Ordinary Boy. You know, I think I'm going to be in World War II for some time to come, and it may be that something else will come to me as well. So, yeah, I I do enjoy researching this period, and I'm very lucky because now I feel that I have so many people that I can I can talk to about the subject. You know, who knows so much about it, which is brilliant for me. Well, that, that's the thing, and that's the last two years we were talking about it on the podcast with Paul is the revolution of now that we you know doing podcasts, YouTube channels, Zoom. Co conference calls has now become the norm and and uh, the, the the number of people i am now in, in engaged with that i wasn't three years ago is incredible and all the different ideas and the cross-pollination between genres the pure military historians the academics the battlefield guides the people who just run websites the people who are in your case writing uh, uh, fiction about it but draw all coming together because we all we all chip away at this understanding of what was it all about and what did these people go through well i think is the the questions i have as i'm entering my upper middle age is is all the whys still the 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 the, the which tank was best stuff i'm kind of bored with that now what is why do people do through this what why did people sign up for regimes what what made people join the ss what made people become a chin dit what may people jump out of aircraft into into combat zones that that they're the questions that i still struggle with so um well it's been brilliant stuff um uh people are just enjoying it uh learning so much that's it so i think we'll we'll bring things to an end and 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 good luck with the writing good luck with all the uh the the the, the future projects and um 
thank you very much for sharing this case study with us, with us, because I think it's given us all a bit of food for thought, which is no bad thing. Well, thank you, Paul, for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. No, well, thank you very much. I'll just take you off screen for a second and come back and bring you in a minute. So, folks, we're back to Animals at War again tomorrow evening. Hugh Davey is coming on to talk about horse transport. So, and a rare exception of World War II, and we're going back to kind of the 18th century to start the story. So there will be mentions of Napoleon and Wellington and Civil War and Robert E. Lee and, and Meade and people like that, and then First World War and Second World War. But it'll be a fascinating insight into how armies reacted to transport when motor vehicles came in and animals are also there. So Hugh is a master of this subject and logistics. So it, Red Army, Third Reich, everything so look forward to that one and then we continue with pigeons and dogs uh, as the week goes on so as usual folks if you are new to world war ii tv don't forget to subscribe to the channel some of you said you didn't receive notifications about today's shows i know that's been something that's been happening on youtube where people think they're subscribed but they're no longer subscribed check you are still subscribed uh check you've got the bell uh uh um uh the click so that you get the notifications because jd at history underground was having a lot of that a few weeks ago where people who are watching him weren't getting notifications so just check you've got your settings right um uh, but i'm gonna bring victoria in to say to say good evening really so that was really good stuff i really i'm not gonna say enjoyed it because it's i did but i i it gave me lots of things to think about my own family members who served and and i i recognized little bits of how you were talking about ron that some of the family members i knew were dealing with um and it, it, I think the same for lots of viewers. They'll they'll recognise little things you said. They go, "Yep, that, that was my granddad." So thank you for that. So brilliant. Thank okay. You, I just want one one thing, one last thing. Talking about pigeons, not the work of an ordinary boy. Is all about pigeons in World War Two. Brilliant connection there. Fantastic stuff. Brilliant. Okay, then, folks, this is Paul Woodard and Victoria Humphreys for World War Two TV saying, "I will see you all again tomorrow." Cheers, everybody. Thanks for your attention. Bye.